Are you a business owner or entrepreneur who's had great success in the business world? And now you want to launch a speaking career to share your message with the world. If that's you, then listen up. 25-year speaking industry veteran Brett Ridgway has released his latest special report, Three Key Things Entrepreneurs Must Master to Build a Profitable Speaking Business. To pick up your copy, go to breadridgeway.com forward slash freebie. Welcome to the Spotlight on Speaking Show with Brett Ridgway, where you'll learn the keys to building a profitable speaking business from speaking industry pros. Each week, we interview a great guest who will share his or her speaking journey, identify what their keys to success have been, and highlight some critical mistakes they've made along the way that you'll want to avoid. Be sure to visit our website at spotlightonspeaking.com. And while you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, sit back, tune in, and get ready to meet this week's guest. Hello again, everyone. This is Brent Ridgeway, and welcome to another edition of the Spotlight on Speaking Show, where each week I do interview various industry speakers. Could be a keynote speaker, could be a platform seller, could be somebody who's just using speaking as a marketing arsenal in their in their toolbox. But this week's my guest is Mitch Axelrod, and Mitch is a 40-plus year entrepreneur, speaker, trainer, and number one best-selling Wall Street Journal, Barnes and Noble, and Amazon author. Mitch has delivered over 3,500 seminars, workshops, keynotes, webinars, executive briefings, and clinics to more than a million people on entrepreneurship, sales, values, and life skills. He has helped his clients generate a whopping $3 billion worth of revenue. He's been featured on WABC, bestseller C-Suite TV, Sales Talk Radio, and dozens of other media. Mitch has taught at NYU, USC, Notre Dame, and is on the faculty at Harvard's Executive Leadership Conference. He's a Gold Mic Award winner for speaking excellence and an industry and, and for his speaking excellence and industry contributions. But Mitch's proudest accomplishment is as a 10 years stay-at-home dad, which is awesome. In 2020, Mitch suffered a stroke and brain aneurysm that left him paralyzed on his right side. His story of rebound, resilience, and recovery is inspirational and transformational. It is my privilege and honor to welcome Mitch Axelrod to the Spot on a Speaking Show. Welcome, Mitch. Oh, so delighted to be with you here today, Brett. So we go back a few years, and we were talking a little bit before the program, I'm trying to remember exactly when and where we met, but we certainly have crossed paths at a few time at industry events over the years. And, you know, Mitch has always been a straight shooter from my perspective and, and tells people what they need to hear if they want to succeed as a speaker or an entrepreneur or whatever it may be. But tell me a little bit more, Mitch, about your speaking journey. You know, when did it begin? How did you get into it? Why speaking? And what uh, niche or niches did you focus on when you first got into the game? Well, the uh, journey started about not 40 plus years ago when I got out of college and um, I decided that I was psychologically unemployable. I couldn't work for anybody. And uh, so I got into financial planning and I did that for 10 years. And how I got all my clients was I put together a seminar and then I would go and do seminars for organizations and anybody who would have me speak. And I did about 200 of those unpaid as a lead generator into what I call this second opinion. So it was a very simple marketing. And then a confluence of events happened in the late 80s, uh, the stock market crash. Uh, and then the uh, law, we lost about a million dollars in a restaurant. And so uh, I had to shift careers. And I said, well, this is what I know how to do. Let me get into training. And uh, rather than going the long route that most speakers took, I made about five phone calls to the five people I thought could potentially give me business. And on the four fourth phone call, uh, someone said, wow, funny you should call. We're doing a year-long program, and I'd love to have you come and do part of it. And so within about 30 days, uh, I had a contract. Now, I went down the training track more than the, the keynote track. 
Uh, and the reason was because I was not a great marketer, you know, like most uh, uh, professionals and most people who are practitioners, I love to speak and train and teach. And I wasn't so crazy about marketing. So I figured, well, if I could get at five gigs, 10 gigs, 20 gigs from one company, I do a lot better than trying to get the same amount of gigs from 20 different companies. So I put myself out basically as a profit improvement specialist. And I focused on what I now call the new game of selling, uh, became my brand and the new game of business. And I started to go after corporations, large companies that wanted to do training that had thousands or hundreds of salespeople or service people. And I really niched into that. And then coming out of the uh, financial services, I knew that business. I worked it so I could relate. I didn't, I didn't have the speaker syndrome like, hey, I never did this, but I can tell you the theory. I got beat up like all the guys and gals in the room. So I had a lot of credibility and I think uh, speakers would do well to go into to if you're starting out or even if you're maturing to really look at where you have credibility, where you have knowledge of the industry. And it just, you know, kind of eased me into the industry. So that's how I got started. Uh, I actually started with Brian Tracy, who I've known for 35 years. And I actually became a distributor of his. And then after three years, I developed my first program called 21 Ways to Double Your Sales. And we'll talk more about that when we get into uh, some licensing, because I got one company to, to pay me for a day-long event. I did the 21 Ways. At the end, the guy comes up to me, he says, we love that. We want it. And I have a, a standard question I ask everybody is like, what do you want to do with it? And he said, we want to give it to all 4,000 of our agents. How much? Now, you got to realize back then the cassettes were still in the machine, right? <laughs> and I just came out and I said, you know, Nightingale Conant, who you remember, was selling six cassettes for like 29 39 So I said to the guy, $10 per person with one condition. You package it, you duplicate it, you ship it. I just want the $10. He said, that's all? I said, yeah. He said, done deal. He wrote a piece of paper. A couple of weeks later, I had a check for 40 grand. And I realized at that moment, I wasn't in the speaking, training, consulting, information game. I was in the intellectual property game. It went from my mouth to the cassette recorder back then. Yep. He heard it, he said, I want it. And without a sales letter or a funnel or anything else, I made 40 grand on that. I never ever did the seminar again. I produced it as a six cassette album, sold a thousand of them through space ads. And that one title literally made me hundreds of thousands of dollars over the next couple of years. Never did the seminar again. Well, so I, that I, got me going into the industry. Yeah, I think it's so interesting. Number one, that you got your start basically because of relationship capital that you built up and reached out to yeah. people that knew you and trusted you. And, and that's how you got your start. And I talk about it all the time. You, I, I think relationships are your most important business asset. Yep. So work through those very carefully. But number two, you touched on something, Mitch, that I don't think most people give thought to because if they're speakers, they're thinking about getting on the platform and sharing their message. And, and, and maybe they, you know, eventually start to get some thought to, hey, well, I need to have back end product or services to, you know, tag on to the, along with the speaking or whatever. But you've approached it from a standpoint that I don't think very many people ever think about. And that's it, it's intellectual property. And you can do a lot more with it than just, you know, speaking from the stage, so to speak. Well, what, you know, there was as a Yogi Berra used to say, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Right. So I was at a fork in the road. And it was, okay, do I go down the path of all my colleagues, Brian Tracy, uh, Stephen Covey at the time, Michael Gerber, I shared the platform with all these guys, right? Mm -hmm. And I noticed one thing that I wanted nothing to do with. They had warehouses filled with inventory, which was good for you because that was the product business. And then they had the pressure of having to sell 
to get the return on that inventory, the profit. And I said, this is kind of bass backwards. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sell the IP first, carry no inventory, and, and, and target audiences where they have to duplicate it themselves. I just want the profit. And I turned a, a, a very heavy inventory overhead business into a high profit business by just looking at it as, as intellectual property, not as product. And it and essentially, I became the only Burger King in the entire industry <laughs> of McDonald's. For everyone else, they're saying, oh, you'll take it the way we created it. And I said, you can have it your way. How do you want it? And then I would give it to them their way. So it was a whole different, and it just opened up huge possibilities because in addition to not having overhead, I could take the parts and the pieces. I'll tell you a story about that, how I really you got to listen to your clients, you know? Um, so really quick. So I, from that 21 ways to W your sales, that same company a year later came back to me and said, we have we want a new training program. We're looking outside the company. We're looking at Brian Tracy, Stephen Covey, and Tony Robbins. I said, what do you want with me? I said, would you like to throw your hat in the ring? You have credibility. I said, sure. So what do I do? I go home and I write out a table of contents. I cannot tell you how unbelievably simple and valuable having a table of contents is. What I sold the 21 ways faxing the table of contents to the company. Yeah. I go back in there and I propose to them that instead of them buying 4,000 units at $250, a million dollars, and then 200 a year through attrition, put me in a studio. I'll record a program. I'll license it back to you for one time 250 grand and you will put me on the map. And they said they couldn't believe it. What's the catch? I said, there is a catch too. One, after six months, you roll it out. You're going to endorse me to your five biggest competitors. They never heard anybody say that before, right? <laughs> I said, second, you're going to do a press release that says that of all the people you searched, I'm the guy you chose to roll out your training. Those two things put me on the map. So when I say to people, do you believe a sheet of paper, one sheet of paper could be worth six figures or maybe seven? Yeah, obviously, absolutely. Yes. So tables of contents, if you don't have a program or you want to develop another program, don't produce it. Produce a table of contents. Go pre-sell it to somebody. Let them record it. License it. Sell it back to them on a favorable deal. I got all of my IP produced paid for before I created it. I did not pay for any of my IP and I've got an extensive library. So that was a shift in thinking. So one more story. I So now I have this big workbook I'm carrying around. Remember the big fat work, three ring binders, it gets oh, yeah. sets on one side, right? I go into a client. He looks at me, he says, what's that? I said, that's my new baby, you know? 250 bucks for you. He says, I ain't buying it. What else you got? Where do you go from there? He said to me, open up the table of contents. Okay. He said, I had 37 modules, which was kind of the style back then. Mm -hmm. He says, I want these five modules. How much? Now, I'm a Jersey guy. He's a Jersey guy. I said, okay, I'm going to get this guy to spend $250. $100 a module. $500 for five modules. And smugly, I sat back thinking he's going to say, I might as well buy the whole workbook, right? For $250. He said, sold. I said, sold? What, are you, what happened here? He says to me, Mitch, you're trying to give it to me my way, your way. I don't want it your way. If I buy that thing, that thing nobody will open it. But if I have you come in and cover the five most important parts that we need, and I'll pay you to train. I have one shot. I get back $500. I'm in the black from that point on. I said, I could kiss you. You just changed my life. <laughs> so what I learned was I stopped carrying the workbook 
and selling the whole thing for 250 which was way more than anybody could absorb. And I carried the table of contents and I said, $100 a module, which ones do you want and how many? And I sold thousands of individual modules to companies where I wouldn't have sold hundreds of whole workbooks. And I realized the parts and the pieces could be worth as much or more than the whole thing. And well, way easier to sell parts, solve one problem. Come So companies would buy three. Yep. They'd come back for three more. They'd come back for three more. And I'd wind up making $1,000 selling 10 modules, then $250 selling the whole workbook. And it totally changed my life. Well, obviously, the lesson here is if you're a speaker, think about other ways that you can deliver your message to the audience. And it isn't just about getting up on the stage and and, and spewing out your wisdom. And, and Mitch built a highly profitable business that catered to the needs specifically of his clients. And I, you know, I think a lot of speakers, Mitch, number one, they don't even think about this particular tact. But number two, they, they go in with the mindset of, like you said, this is it, and you take it as it is, and you have no other options, you know, take it or leave it type thing. And by giving them the, the module option or whatever, you open up a whole arena that, you know, basically probably didn't even exist so much in the industry at all. So kudos to you, sir. You know, I, I often say to people, the old 80-20 rule, I use it in relationships with clients, and I, I talk 20%, and I listen 80%. Mm-hmm. And of the 20% that I speak, I try to use 80% of that time to ask questions that get right to the heart of what they want. And I try, I tell people, you know, I have the only training program I know of for sales where there's no module on handling objections. And you say, how could that be? Well, I find that people don't object to getting what they want. What they object to is somebody trying to give them what they don't want. And that sounds so ridiculously, obviously simple. And I tell people, why are we trying to give people what they don't want when you could just give them what they want and not force them to take all the stuff they don't want to get what they do want? And then they begin to see, oh, my God, that um, five-part series or 10-part book or 12-part a uh, we- webinar program, whatever, is 5, 10, 12 individual pieces of IP that if you unbundle and really deconstruct and look at your IP as pieces and parts, you might double, triple, quadruple the number of options you can give somebody. So they don't have to object to getting what they don't want. They just get what they do want. And then you come back and give. So one nugget of wisdom is worth pounds and pounds of information. So we're not in the information game. We're in the wisdom game. We're in the problem solving game. And that game is one nugget at a time, one problem at a time, one solution at a time. That's how I've always approached it and seems to work out pretty well. So you consider yourself, I take it, more a trainer than a speaker from our conversation. So as a trainer, what do you feel some of your three biggest keys to being successful as a trainer have been? Well, I'll make one slight adjustment to what you said. That's fine. I don't like labels. So I don't call myself a speaker. I do speak. I don't call myself a trainer. I train. I, those are modalities of delivery. So speaking is business, right? If you want to be a keynote speaker, it's a business. You got to focus on that business. But if you're in the profit improvement business, as I call myself, then all the mediums, speaking, training, consulting, IP, webinars, whatever the delivery mechanism is, is just the delivery mechanism, all right? What the business is, it's like, when people say, I speak, great. Okay, what do you speak about? But it, it isn't even what you speak about. It's like, what change, transformation, or transportation do you provide your audience, whether it's an audience of one or one million, that either helps them to be better, transforms them, transports them, and there are different people after having experienced you. 
where do you take them? Do you just get up there and give a good speech? Or do you, at the end of your talk, do people get up and say, let's march? It's like, yeah, they're ready to do something. And so you really have to examine why are you in this business? Um, and, you know, we're, we're talking here amongst friends. Uh, and the reality is we all have egos. Let's face it. I wanted to be a teacher. But when I got out of college, teachers were paid like eight grand a year. And I said, I don't want to do that. So I found that I was really good at teaching uh, more valuable information that higher, had a higher value than teaching in a school, let's say, mm -hmm. right? And that's why I gravitated toward doing more training. Plus, it was much easier um, to get two or four or six gigs, whatever, from one company, you know? I was good at selling, but I wasn't good at marketing. So I figured, you know, if I'm in a relationship, you said it really great. Relationship capital is more valuable than money. Money comes, money goes. Money is consumable, but relationships are forever and they pay off. I mean, we haven't spoken in quite a while and you reached out to me is like, whatever you need, I'll do based on the longevity, based on this uh, solid relationship we had. You know, you meet people, you don't talk to them in five, 10 years, you pick up right, right where you left off. Yeah. So I agree with you. Relationship capital, um, looking to get multiple gigs from one company and then figuring out, you know, what value do I bring? What real transformation do I? And the only way you find that out is to ask your clients one question. Why do you hire me? Why do you buy from me? Why do you use me? And that one question has produced literally hundreds of millions of dollars for my clients. So those are some of the things I would suggest. Those are all such excellent points, Mitch. And I have a couple other questions I want to ask you. But before I do, let's take a quick break with a word from our sponsor. Are you a business owner or entrepreneur who's had great success in the business world? And now you want to launch a speaking career to share your message with the world. If that's you, then listen up. 25-year speaking industry veteran Brett Ridgway has released his latest special report, Three Key Things Entrepreneurs Must Master to Build a Profitable Speaking Business. To pick up your copy, go to brettridgeway.com forward slash freebie. And we're back at, with our guest, Mitch Axelrod, on the Spotlight on Speaking Show. And, and what I want to ask you now, Mitch, honestly, is one of my favorite questions, and that is asking you to bare your soul a little bit and share maybe a couple of mistakes you've made along the way that you would highly encourage speakers, trainers, content providers, whatever title you want to put on them to avoid making. Oh, God, that I could fill a book with those. <laughs> um, I think, well, first thing, uh, there are four types of what we call entrepreneurs and you have to really determine because I'm a practitioner, right? I'm not looking to build a million dollar empire. So like if you try to build something that you're not capable of, or you're not really passionate about, or that you're trying to do because somebody else's model, you're trying to, I think the most important thing is both a double-edged sword. It's a mistake I made, you know, looking outside and, saying, oh, well, those guys are successful. I might as well model them. That works to a certain point. But in today's world, you have to find your uniqueness. And that's an inside out game. So uh, for, the mis for the people who are seeking the solutions and the answers, take your cues from out there, get advice, but you got to go in here and see, you know, what makes you unique, especially if you're a speaker, because, you know, speakers are a dime a dozen. That not when I started, there weren't quite as many. So there was less competition. Second thing I would say is curiosity may have killed the cat, but it can really kill a business. And, and I'm so curious. I like to master things and then move on. And so I have, I have to really be careful of like, I'm bored with this, you know, uh, and, and your, your customers, Customers don't leave companies. Companies leave customers. Hmm. That's what I found. Okay. When you think about it, so think of terms of what some of the biggest mistakes people make. I made it initially because I was looking for the next sale, 
but I didn't realize, oh my goodness, this client can pay me so much more in referrals, new business, endorsements, testimonials, introductions. All right. So it was like, you don't need a whole lot of people. You need a core group of people who are really strong and will help you with anything. Um, and then one thing I didn't do, which I learned to do later, and I call it the three list uh, formula. One list is keep track of all the people that love you, that would help you no matter what. And we all need help. Second thing, your clients who you've done the best work for who would love you and would help you. And then third list is whether it's the names of companies or industries or whatever that you would really like to get into. And when you look at those three, chances are good. If you go back to 10 people in each of those three lists or the first two, you could get to a third list, hmm. right? And and I was scattershot. You know, I'd take whoever wanted me to be a client. And I, once I got really clear that train, I was good at training. I wasn't, I didn't call myself a trainer, but I was good at training. I realized I could go in and propose longer term deals. Uh, and whether it be six months or six gigs or whatever it would be. So um, those are some of the mistakes that I learned early on. I would say the biggest thing is don't make the same mistake three or four or five times. Right. Try to, you know, <laughs> learn the second time. All right. Well, it's been so awesome catching up with you, Mitch, and I appreciate so much you jumping on here today and sharing your expertise with, with folks. If they wish to get into Mitch Axelrod's world and find out a little bit more about what you're doing these days, how do they do that? Uh, you can either go to my main site, which is MitchAxelrod.com, or my two other main sites, the new game of selling.com or the new game of ip.com where i kind of bear all my uh, secrets about and tell stories of how i did my ip deals and uh how i used one to leverage into another and how i had no inventory no overhead and no warehouses which i like all right outstanding stuff mitch so this has been another episode of the spotlight on speaking show with brett ridgeway as always i thank you so much for being on here if you ha haven't had a chance yet Hop on over to SpotlightOnSpeaking.com and register there so that you can be notified of upcoming episodes. And as always, I wish you the greatest success in all that you do as you work to build your successful business as a speaker. Everyone, take care. God bless. This has been the Spotlight on Speaking Show with Brett Ridgway. Be sure to join us every week as we interview speaking industry pros and have them share their best tips for building a profitable speaking business. Until next week, thank you for tuning in and remember to visit our website at SpotlightOnSpeaking.com so you can enjoy even more great episodes like this one. While you're here, be sure to subscribe via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Spotlight on Speaking Show. Until then, our sincere best wishes to you for the greatest of success as you work to build your own profitable speaking business.